Thank you for inviting me. It's always uh, fun to, to come over to the library for, for events. Um, the, yeah, the, the, the talk today is is based on the book. I'll do some readings from the book and uh, we'll show you some of the photographs that are that are featured in it. Um, then titled, uh, People Who Aren't From Revelstoke Can Wonder About the Title, Brown Bag History. But of course, anybody from town knows that I've been doing Brown Bag History talks at the museum since, uh, well, for about uh, 12, 13 years now. I think 2003 was the first year that uh, we started doing them. And uh, we, I do them every other Wednesday at, uh, at noon. So it's a so lunch hour talk, hence the, the brown bag uh, title. Um, I think I did steal it from another, stole the title from another museum. That, you know, we museum folks do that a lot if we find good ideas from other places. We, we just appropriate them. But uh, it's been a really good idea in Revelstoke. It's, as after 12 years, we're still getting really good audiences for it. And um, after having about 200 talks, I thought it was probably time to start putting them in book form. So uh, this is, hopefully is volume one of maybe about 10. And um, they're based on some of the themes. So for the first one, I chose the theme Revelstoke Origins. So it's uh, really the, the very early history of Revelstoke, how the town developed, why we're here, uh, sort of that whole really introduction to, to Revelstoke history or you know, almost Revelstoke history 101. Uh, so some of the basic questions that people ask when they come in, where we, why are we here, where did the name come from, so, uh, and some of the, and, and I, I like the, I really enjoy the early, early history, that's sort of my my special passion. Part of it is that there's nobody uh, around who's old enough to uh, <laughs> that I say, so there's that, there's that advantage. Um, but I really do enjoy the, the early history, and Revelstoke has an exciting and interesting early history, so it was, it was fun to do. Um, I have started volume two. I've got about two sentences written <laughs> for the next one, so I'm well on my way. <laughs> um, so the first chapter of this one is uh, called Not an Empty Landscape. And the idea behind that is that there's there were people here before there was settlement here, and really acknowledging that. And that history has really become lost over the, the many years. So I'm just going to start with my first paragraph for, uh, from the book, Not an Empty Landscape. The accounts in this book deal with the early settled history of Revelstoke. Oh, I think I'm going to take a minute because I thought I had reset this, but I'm going to <coughs> you go back. Would you prefer the lights off or on? Unfortunately, it's all off or all on. The delay here. Okay, we're going to try this again. Hopefully, it'll do what I want it to do. The, from the first chapter of the book, Not an Empty Landscape. The accounts in this book deal with the early settled history of Revelstoke. It is important to remember, as we are reading them, that the pioneer settlers did not come into a land that had never been inhabited. The Sinaiac's First Nation population was very much a part of this landscape, but because of circumstances, it has been far too easy over the years to ignore their historic presence here. When I began working at Revelstoke Museum and Archives in 1983, I was told that there was never a significant First Nations population in this region. They may have come here occasionally to hunt and fish, but they never spent much time here because they didn't like the snow and they were afraid of the mountains. 
We know now that is simply not the case. But the truth is very complicated and has never been an easy story to tell. That does not excuse us from not telling it, though. And we are currently trying to find better ways to honor the history of the first people who inhabited this land. The Sinaiaks lived on the Columbia River system, which includes the Arrow Lakes and its tributaries. Their name can be translated to mean people of the place of the bull trout. Their territory stretched roughly from present-day Colville, Washington, to north of Revelstoke, and parts of the Kootenai River up to Nelson and the Lardo, as well as the Sulcan Valley. The Sinaiaks are interior Salish, and they share characteristics and language similarities with the Okanagan and the Sequebnik. They were skilled hunters, fishers, and harvesters, and over many generations in this territory had learned the cycles of the land and how to live in harmony with them. They lived in pit houses in villages throughout their territory and moved depending on the season and the cycle. One village may have been left vacant for a period of two or more years in order to allow the food resources in that area to be replenished. People who live from the land quickly learn not to overfish or overhunt a specific area. And in this uh, chapter, I also talk about uh, some of the encounters of uh, the early settlers with uh, the Sinaiaks. Um, the tension between the Sinaiaks and the settlers culminated in the shooting of a Sinaiaks man known as Cultus Jim at Galena Bay in May of 1894. The Kootenai Mail of May 19, 1894 carried the headline, Killed an Indian. Sam Hill sends a bullet through the heart of Cultus Jim. Right from the start, the white population threw its support behind Sam Hill claiming that he was defending his property and his life. Despite conflicting evidence from Cultus Jim's wife, Adeline, Sam Hill was found to be not guilty on the grounds of self-defense. An article in the Kootenai Mail almost a year later, on April 13, 1895, called for a ban on allowing the dangerous Colvilles into Canada and gave an account of the shooting of Cultus Jim. Nothing that could have happened would more strongly emphasize the absolute necessity of action by the Canadian government than what occurred last summer when a Canadian settler, quietly making his farm improvements, was attacked by a savage Colville Indian and compelled to defend his life and his property with his rifle. The chances were 10 to 1 that he would be killed, but his alertness and unerring aim saved him, and the Indian was made to suffer. The settler, Samuel Hill, owned the land by grant from the provincial government and was rightfully and peaceably improving it as a home, whereas Cultus Jim demanded that he should leave the, because the ringing noises caused by the blows of his civilizing axe frightened away the game from the Indians' traps that were set nearby. That's a really uh, clear telling of that, of that conflict and that complete difference in worldviews between the two cultures. And I do go into detail in the book about uh, why the, why the uh, Sinaiaks weren't living in a more permanent way in their territory by the time that there were settlers here. It's a, obviously a long story. Uh, we are in um, a discussion with members of the Sinaiaks who are now part of the Colville Confederated Tribes, and we're currently working on an exhibit that we're hoping that we'll be able to open sometime this spring. Uh, another photograph of the Sinaiaks family in their very distinctive uh, uh, sturgeon nose canoe. The second chapter is uh, on the, the Farwell town site, and I've subtitled it Disturbing the Soil. Um, it's a, th this is really uh, crucial to understanding how the how how Revelstoke uh, developed. Uh, this is uh, Albert Stanhope Farwell, who was uh, came to uh, Victoria in 1864 and was a government surveyor. At one time, he was actually surveyor general of uh, BC. He uh, worked with Walter Moberly when Walter Moberly was doing survey work in this area. So he'd been in, in this area uh, before there was settlement here, before the, the railway came through. So when the, the railway was coming through in, in 1885, uh, or that was you know, when, it, when it, uh, they were doing survey work in the early 18, 1880s, 
and uh, Rogers, uh, Major Rogers had discovered Rogers Pass, it was clear that this was where the railway was going to go through. Um, Farwell managed to get a claim in with the provincial government uh, before the CPR filed their survey plan. Once the CPR filed their survey plan, it put all of this land in the railway belt and uh, therefore under the, the control of, the, uh, of, of the, the Canadian Pacific Railway. So that was where the dispute came through, was who had the right to, uh, to grant the land in this area. Here's a, a little book of, uh, or a little bit of, of that uh, story. Barbell made out an application for a land grant covering Block 6, Block 1, Kootenai District on October 20, 1883. The grant was 20 miles in length on each side of the Columbia and four miles back. It included what became the town site of Farwell, comprising the area now bounded by Front Street, Victoria Road, and Kootenai Street. It also included much of the area now known as Columbia Park, including the sites of the present golf course and cemetery. In July of 1884, the Commissioner of Lands and Works instructed that the land applied uh, for by Farwell be surveyed. Farwell himself did that survey. The land grant was paid for on November 17, 1884. To understand how this simple land grant affected the development of Revelstoke, we have to go back to the British Columbia Terms of Union and to the Dominion of Canada in 1871. One of the terms was that the Dominion would begin the construction of a railway towards the Pacific to connect the seaboard of BC with the railway system of Canada. As part of this undertaking, the government of BC agreed to convey up to 20 miles of land on each side of the railway to the Dominion government. In return for this land, the Dominion government paid $100,000 per year to the province. These lands, known as the railway belt, were in some cases granted to the Canadian Pacific Railway. The CPR expected they, they would have full title to the land that Farwell had applied for. At the time that Farwell filed his application, the route for the CPR had not yet been registered. Although Sir Sanford Fleming, surveyor for the company, advised the BC government on September 28, 1883, that he had examined and approved the route and that the company was ready to begin construction. Major A.V. Rogers had completed the survey of Rogers Pass from both east and west by 1883, and it was widely believed that this would be the route of the main line and that it would pass directly through the land grant applied for by Farwell. It is almost certain that Farwell knew this and that he intended to sell land to the CPR. The company was incensed that the Farwell lands were not in their reservation and felt that the Farwell grant should never have been allowed. And uh, there's uh, a lot in this chapter about really going into the details of how that went back and forth. Um, this, um, of course, the, um, there was no Revelstoke newspaper at that time, but I was able to find accounts in both the Calgary Herald and the Victoria Colonist from that time. Here's uh, an interesting article from the Calgary Herald of August 5th, 1885. Finding that he could not prevail upon the householders to buy the lots on which their buildings stand, Mr. Farwell at last had resource to legal proceedings. He prosecuted them for disturbing the soil and assessed the damages at $100. Several test cases were tried by Sir Matthew uh, Begby, and he decided in favor of Mr. Farwell. There the matter uh, rests for the present, no steps having been made to enforce judgment. It appears that although Mr. Farwell has a crown grant of the land, he is not able to give a deed for the lots, hence the unwillingness of the townspeople to part with their money. So it, it really put the town in limbo for a long time. Um, so finally, in, uh, it was, wasn't until it became a, a court uh, a proceedings that was in the courts for several years. And it says, at last in the Kootenai Mail of April 6, 1895, the following headline appeared, End of Town Site Troubles. The article explained the settlement agreement. By this settlement, the Dominion agrees, upon receiving from the province the monies the latter demanded in payments for land in the railway belt, to issue Dominion patents to the holders of those lands, provided they are not already covered with patents issued by the Dominion. To the people of Revelstoke, the provincial recognition of Dominion patents and vice versa will be a great boon. It's a picture of the, the Farwell settlement. <coughs> uh, 
um, no, the uh, the uh, one of the the main consequences of this uh, whole dispute was uh, the fact that our downtown is not on Front Street, which was the original uh, settlement in the original downtown. Our downtown is up here, and that was be that's because the railway, uh, refusing to negotiate with Farwell, moved their yards outside of his land grant. So uh, the main business street of the Farwell settlement was Front Street. During railway construction in 1885, a business district sprang up quickly, with general stores, hotels, saloons, and even brothels. As the town developed and grew, the businesses did as well, and expanded to include the services necessary for a growing town. If Farwell had been able to make a deal with the CPR for sale of the land that he had claimed, it is likely that the railway operations would have been built in Columbia Park, and Front Street would have remained as the business section. Instead, the CPR moved their operations outside of Farwell's grant, establishing a station and yards at the base of Mount Revelstoke, where they remain today. The CPR encouraged businesses to locate it along Mackenzie Avenue and First Street, and this certainly made sense to business owners who did not want to pay extra shipping charges to get their wares down to Front Street. Eventually, the station town site took precedence, and by the 1920s, there were very few businesses business buildings remaining on Front Street. Today, Front Street is entirely residential, and most of the current buildings were constructed after the 1950s. Uh, the um, next uh, chapter is um, probably one of my favorite, all-time favorite stories, what's known as the Farwell Police War. And uh, it has to do, a lot of the stories in this book have to do with that whole dispute between the provincial and the Dominion government. And uh, it just continued to cause problem after problem. And one of the, the problems is that, uh, it, although Revelstoke was, uh, or Farwell, at that, which was Farwell until 1886, was a, uh, an independent community, and uh, there were businesses there, there were hotels and saloons uh, with uh, that had legitimate uh, liquor licenses from the provincial government. The, uh, C the uh, Dominion government was providing policing along the railway line uh, by the Northwest Mounted Police, and they were enforcing a rule of uh, no liquor sales in the railway belt. So you can see uh, where that dispute would have come into full force here. Um, anything involving liquor is going to be, uh, is going to be a bit of a problem. Uh, so we had the, um, just going to jump back and forth here a bit, we had Gilbert Malcolm Sprout, who was uh, finally brought in uh, in about the middle of 1885 as a magistrate, and uh, along with him was a man named, uh, referred to as Big Jack Kirka, who was uh, the, the first uh, police officer in Revelstoke. He had previously worked in uh, Yale during railway construction earlier railway construction, so he was the, had a big reputation as a, a, a law enforcer. Um, there's a story that, I'm not sure if I, oh yeah, I do have it in here. Uh, so finally at the, the end of April 1885, John Kirka, known as Big Jack, was appointed as chief constable by the province. Kirka was a, another outstanding British Columbia pioneer in more ways than one. He stood six foot three inches tall, an unusual height for that era. Kirkup was born in Ontario in 1855 and came to BC in 18, 1877, where he joined the Victoria Police. He became a provincial police officer in 1881 and worked out of Yale as a police officer during railway construction. When he arrived at Farwell, he already had a reputation as a fair but no-nonsense police officer. At one point in his career, he was pursuing a criminal south of the border and was joined by famed frontier artist Frederick Remington, whose sketches of Kirkup were published in Harper's Magazine in 1891. Pioneer resident Sarah Dickey recalled that on her first morning in Revelstoke in 1886, she looked out the window to see Kirkup crossing the street with a drunken man under each arm. <laughs> Such a man was just what the frontier town of Farwell required. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Kirk, uh, Sprout and, uh, and uh, Kirkup were enforcing the provincial law, and then at uh, the top of the Douglas Street Hill, 
around where, if anybody knows where Ruby Cameron lives, it's right around where, where Ruby lived, was the uh, Northwest Mounted Police Barracks uh, with uh, Sam Steele in charge. And Sam Steele was a well-known uh, police officer. Uh, Fort Steele is, is named after him. Uh, but the, the conflict uh, happened when the, the, the two forces were enforcing these two different laws. And uh, saloon owners or uh, hotel keepers were trying to bring in uh, liquor supplies and the uh, Dominion officers were seizing them. And uh, there were definitely, there was um, notes in the Victorian newspapers um, with uh, some concern about what was happening to this seized liquor uh, at the, the, the Dominion offices. Uh, so uh, the conflict between the two forces came to a head in September of 1885 when a Dominion constable was brought before provincial magistrate Sprote on a charge of larceny by illegally apprehending liquor from a provincially licensed seller. Sprote adjourned the hearing so that George Hope Johnston could appear as a witness and assist the accused. And George Hope Johnston was uh, left in charge of the, uh, the barracks in, uh, in Farwell because uh, Sp uh, Steele had been called away. Uh, so Johnson agreed to, or um, uh, Sprout agreed to let the constable out on a small bail. But before he could grant bail, the Dominion constable simply walked out of the log court courthouse and returned to the Northwest Mounted Police Barracks at the top of the hill. Sprout sent two special provincial constables to bring the prisoner back. But upon arriving at the barracks, they were set upon by Johnston and five or six others at the barracks. One of the provincial constables was knocked down dragged inside the barracks, and after what was referred to in the press as a burlesque trial, was sentenced to 14 days hard labor. The other constable was also assaulted, but managed to escape, and immediately reported back to Sprout. Sprout placed a warrant for the bail-jumping Dominion constable in the hands of John Miles, a regular provincial constable, but advised him to wait a few days to execute the warrant, in the hopes that the animosity would die down somewhat. The day after, a group of special constables from the Northwest Mounted Police Barracks, including the escaped Dominion Constable, marched down the street with revolvers. John Miles presented the warrant, at which point all of the Dominion officers surrounded him, handcuffed him, and dragged him up to the barracks, where he was put into a cell. The warrant and its copy were taken from him and torn up. Sprout was outraged by the way his constables were being treated and made arrangements to storm the barracks the next morning and rescue them. Newspaper accounts of the event are confusing and contradictory, but it appears that the provincial police force went to the barracks, where they captured Johnston and his chief of police, and conveyed them to the provincial prison. Johnston requested that Sheriff Kirkup send a special constable, a provincial constable, uh, with something that he required. And when the constable arrived, he was captured and thrown into the cell with Miles in, back in the, in the Northwest Mounted Police Barracks. Johnston finally agreed to free the provincial constables, and he was released on bail. So it uh, sort of went from bad to worse, but it finally just kind of fizzled out. Everybody kind of calmed down a little bit. And uh, they sent over um, Colonel J.F. McLeod, Fort McLeod is named after, to... Um, come and try to figure out what had happened. And uh, as a result, they kind of slapped Johnston on, on the wrist and said that uh, he had uh, behaved outside of his authority. Uh, but they sort of put it down to his youth. And uh, within, within, um, the, within the year, the Northwest Mounted Police barracks had gone once they had finished uh, construction in the area. So things kind of died down and it went under provincial control. Uh, but to end up this chapter, I had um, our uh, very talented local cartoonist, Rob Buchanan, did a couple of cartoons for the books, for the book, and this is one that he did for this chapter. Brigands and Veil Jumpers. If you asked me, I'd say the whole lot of them could use a wee dram of brotherly love. <laughs> <laughs> The next chapter is uh, Farwell Becomes Revelstoke. And this is probably one of the most asked questions I get about uh, why the town is, is named Revelstoke. Uh, so I'll explain a little bit about who, um, who Revelstoke is. This is uh, Edward Baring, and uh, 
he was uh, born in 1828 in England into a family of financial entrepreneurs. Uh, his great-grandfather, John Baring, came to Exeter, England from Bremen, Germany in 1717 and became a cloth merchant and trader. So his sons um, began uh, speculating on trade um, bills and accepting bills of exchange between buyers and sellers. And this eventually developed into the Baring Brothers Financial Institution. And uh, so they had a long history of international finance. Uh, so by um, uh, 1885, uh, Edward Baring had been raised to the peerage in England as Lord Revelstoke. And uh, he purchased a uh, property in Devon, England uh, that was um, originally uh, named, the parish was named uh, Revelstoke after uh, a man named Re uh, Richard Revel, who was Lord of Stoke in uh, 1198 and uh, changed the name to Revelstoke. So uh, Barry took the name of Lord Revelstoke when he was raised to the peerage. So it was in the summer of 1885 that Edward Barry, as head of Barry Brothers, was approached by George Stephen, president of the CPR. The company was in serious financial straits by that time after the immense costs of building the railway across Canada. On July 20th, 1885, the Parliament of Canada approved a relief bill which provided for the issue of $35 million in 55-year 5% bonds, as well as the postponement of repayment of $29 million in loans until 1891. Once the bill was passed, George Stephen went to London, England to find a buyer for the bond issue. Bering Brothers agreed to take £3 million, the equivalent of nearly $15 million Canadian, at 90% of par value. The following year, Bering spot up the remainder of the shares at 99.4 cents on the dollar. This allowed the CPR to repay their government loans immediately. So um, we know that the uh, Canadian Pacific Railway uh, weren't terribly fond of Farwell, and uh, they wanted to honor Lord Revelstoke, so they felt they were able to kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> And uh, they put in a request to the post office department. There was a letter from uh, William Van Horn, uh, president of the CPR, that was written on uh, April 14, 1886. We proposed to name our station at the second crossing of the Columbia Revel River, Revelstoke, so called after the head of the firm of Bearings, who was one of the trustees under our first mortgage. The place in question will be one of our division points and a place of some importance. And providing you have no objection to the name selected, we will adopt it from this out. The present name of the town at this point is Farwell, called after an adventurer who squatted there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, an interesting interpretation of the, the Farwell dispute right now. So on April 20th, 1886, William White, secretary of the post office department, wrote to William Van Horn, approving the name change. I have held over your letter respecting the change of name at Farwell for a few days, wishing to show it to Sir Alexander, but he has been unwell, and I will therefore undertake to make the change you ask without further delay. That is, have the Farwell post office called Revelstoke, which will have one advantage at any rate. It will give us a name, whereas the other, Farwell, amounted to nothing at all. <laughs> uh, so that name change took place uh, on uh, June 1st, 1886. And uh, Lord Revelstoke, uh, the title is still in existence. The uh, James Baring, who was the great grandson of Edward Charles Baring, uh, succeeded uh, to the title of, as the sixth Baron Revelstoke in 2003. And uh, he visited Revelstoke in 2009. And to my knowledge, he's the only Lord Revelstoke who's been here. Uh, James passed away in uh, 2012 at the age of 73, and his oldest son, uh, Alexander Rupert, Rupert Baring, is currently the seventh Baring, Baron of Revelstoke. And here's another Rob Buchanan cartoon. Lord Revelstoke, the Canadian Pacific Railway Company is wondering if you'd like to invest in one of its new towns. Does it have a ski hill? <laughs> uh, chapter five is life in Farwell. So talking a little bit about uh, about the community and uh, what it was like in, in the early days. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here, but 
Um, there's all the descriptions of Farwell make mention of the brothels. There continued to be active brothels in the Farwell section of Revelstoke until after World War II. The museum has an, in its collection a Revelstoke City Police Register covering the years 1900 to 1907. In 1900, more than 50 different women were charged with, offices, with, charged with offenses relating to prostitution. The madams, or brothel owners, were generally charged up to $20 for each offense, with the inmates being charged four or five dollars. These were considerable sums at the time, and in some cases the women were charged and fined three or four times in one year. It would have been seen as a business cost by the women running the brothels. The museum has only one photograph of a brothel, with several well-dressed women sitting in a room with suggestive paintings on the walls. We know some of the names of the prostitutes, but we don't know their stories. There were few options for women without means in this era. In the 1901 census, a few of the women actually listed their occupation as prostitutes, while others claimed to be seamstresses, musicians, or domestic servants. So another photograph of uh, Farwell showing uh, some of the early business buildings. The one on this Right on this end is the uh, Columbia House Hotel, which is the, the first hotel built in Revelstoke. And uh, that's a nice segue into chapter six on the Front Street Hotels. That was a, really a big component of, of Front Street. The new community of Farwell had a large, ever-changing population during the railway construction years of the 1880s, with many construction workers traveling through and others trying to cash in on the boom. Several hotels sprang up on the busy main thoroughfare of Front Street. Some of them were little more than shacks, and in some cases, large canvas tents. Some hotels had proper rooms, while others had a round pasture, which was simply a large room with cots and blankets. One of the main reasons for opening a hotel was because it was the easiest way to get a liquor license. This is a photograph of the Victoria Hotel dining room, which was one of the, the, the early hotels. And uh, this was the uh, Central Hotel. And uh, the uh, Central Hotel was opened by the Abrahamson family. Um, so brothers John Charles and Andrew Abrahamson came to Revelstoke in 1885. The brothers were born in Dorsland, Sweden, and came first to Minnesota, and then to Canada in 1881 following railway construction across the country as contractors. They established a hotel at Beavermouth and later moved their operations to the new town of Farwell. John and Charles arrived on May 6th, the night before the fire that swept through the town, destroying many of the existing buildings. They had brought most of their stock with them, but could not find any packers willing to carry their pool table on the tote road through Rogers Pass. <laughs> the pool table was a prized asset for the hotel operation and was a good money maker for the business. Brother Andrew was given the, the task of getting the pool table to Farwell, so he loaded it onto a raft and on May 1st, set off along the Columbia River, traveling the Big Bend with his dog Watch and his cat Molly. As he passed through Death Rapids, Andrew felt his raft suddenly lurch down a steep pitch of water but paddling furiously to keep away from the rocks, he made it through. Andrew, the dog, the cat, and the pool table all arrived safely in Farwell on May 8th, two days after his brothers. They set up a 40-foot square canvas tent on Front Street, and before winter they had built a wood framework around it, faced with uh, split cedar shakes. The next spring they made their central hotel more substantial. The hotel was renovated and added to over the years, and by 1908 was a grand three-story hotel with 50 guest rooms. Uh, there was another uh, Swedish family that also came, uh, the, the Stone family, and uh, they had uh, another similar uh, story. Um, the um, Stone, Mr. Uh, Stone had been traveling across uh, railway construction with his son, Albert, or uh, yeah, Albert, uh, John Albert Stone. And uh, when they got to, he, he, along the way, he decided to start doing a bakery and then uh, started uh, doing little hotels or guest houses along the way. 
And uh, when they got to uh, Donald, they decided that they would follow construction into Revelstoke, and this would be their final stop, and they'd uh, re go into the hotel business here. So uh, Mr. Uh, Stone was uh, staying with uh, Donald, staying at Donald, and he had a crew of people that he had hired to start the building of his hotel here in Revelstoke. And he was a little concerned about what they might be doing without him watching. So he decided to send his son, John Albert, over to, uh, uh, to supervise the construction workers. Uh, John Albert was 16 years old. <laughs> and uh, he, um, so he walked from Donald to Farwell. This was before the railway was completed through Rogers Pass. Uh, this was a letter that he wrote in, uh, to Earl Dickey in 1938. I arrived at First Crossing, Donald, about September 1884, and remained there till the latter part of February 1885, at which time I started on foot for Second Crossing, Farwell, which I reached March 1st. As far as I remember, it took me about four or five days. The first night I spent at Beaver, which was a pretty busy, busy place at the time. It soon died, however, as the people started to move out later in the spring, as the track lane moved westward. On arrival here, I found a very lively place. Both sides of Front Street were built up from the corner to the railway. The number of hotels and restaurants were about 14, I think. Also a number of stores, dance halls, and gambling places. The population varied a great deal, but it would be safe to say that there were 2,000 at times. About the 7th of May, 1885, fully one half of the town was burned down, but was speedily rebuilt and doing business again. Let's just stop a moment and contemplate John Albert's highly understated account of his walk to Farwell. This was a 16-year-old boy walking by himself over a pack trail at the end of February. He would have walked through Rogers Pass, which undoubtedly had heavy snowfall, and he would also have been traveling past construction camps with plenty of unsavory characters. So it just, I find that just an incredible story. Uh, another really interesting uh, character in Revelstoke's early history was Edward Mallandane, and I think most of us will uh, know him as the, the boy in the picture of the driving of the last spike. Uh, just going to skip ahead to this photograph. Uh, so this is Edward Mallandane who uh, is 17 years old, but he looks about 12 there. So he was actually born in Victoria. His father was a, uh, an architect and, uh, and civil engineer. And he decided he wanted to go off on an adventure. He wanted to uh, go to uh, Manitoba and fight in the Riel Rebellion. But uh, he got this far and uh, decided that the rebellion was pretty much over. So somebody suggested that he could do a little Pony Express run between uh, Farwell and Eagle Pass Landing, which is uh, Sycamus. And uh, so he talked a lot about uh, what the area was like in that time. He gave an account of his uh, time here uh, later in the 1940s. But he said, it was interesting to see 50 men or so hanging over the face of the cliffs at Summit Lake, drilling holes in the face, and later, twice a day, to watch the blasts and hear the noise in a confined pass resembling thunder, and hundreds of tons of rock sent hurtling through the air. It was also interesting to note day by day the thousands of feet of earth removed and notice the swarms of men slaving away like ants for the good of the gigantic enterprise. I once saw a hundred foot Houtrus bridge put together in place in a single day. Uh, and then he goes on to describe uh, life in, in Revelstoke and his, his work here. Um, he was in Farwell the, on November 6th, the day before the last bike was driven, and managed to get on the work train that was heading out to the, uh, to the ceremony. Um, talked about, uh, it, was not a, it was an uncomfortable uh, trip. He said, far into the darkness of the night we traveled, shivering with cold lying down on top of the steel rails, unable to sleep, almost shaken to pieces as the train traveled slowly over the unballasted and rough roadbed. Finally, it came to an end. It was pitch dark and we were able to get off, and after a great deal of difficulty, we managed to snatch a short sleep in a vacant box car. All through the night, the rails were laid from both east and west, and early the following morning, November 7th, we were astir 
watching the rails gradually approaching each other. Um, and it talks about uh, Sir Donald Smith uh, to drive the last spike. Said uh, the uh, three photographs were taken by a little humpbacked photographer named Ross of Ross Best and Company, Winnipeg. One when Sir Donald had the hammer over his shoulder, preparatory to striking. One with the hammer over his head, and one with the hammer on the nail head. Then he quickly and in the most workmanlike manner drove the sp spike home. Everybody cheered. The locomotives whistled and shrieked. Several s short speeches were made. Hands were shaken. And Major Rogers, the discoverer of the past named after him, became so gleeful that he upended a huge tide and tried to mark the spot by the side of the track by sticking it in the ground. <laughs> Thus was the Dominion of Canada bound together by bands of steel reaching from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So um, Mellendane went on to have uh, an interesting career. He was uh, involved uh, with the uh, Kootenai Regiment of the Canadian Army Forestry Corps. And um, he was also the founder of the, the town of Preston. Uh, mm -hmm. He became a civil engineer himself. So in 1945, he came here for uh, uh, the Golden Spike Days, which is a ceremony held by the, the local people. And uh, the group of uh, locals did a reenactment of the driving of the last spike. And here Malandane is shaking hands with a young lad who is portraying him in the reenactment photograph. And we've got another uh, Rob Buchanan cartoon. <laughs> it seems like an awful lot of work for no passengers. Or no <laughs> uh, another interesting character was a fellow named uh, Pothole Kelly, who was uh, actually our first um, member of provincial parliament, or uh, what now referred to as MLA, for this area. Uh, we actually have his um, original typescript that he uh, gave to a local historian, uh, wrote it in 1922, and it's uh, quite interesting. There's not a lot of punctuation in it, so we have to do a little bit of sorting out sometimes to, uh, to figure out exactly what he's trying to say. But uh, he uh, came out from Ontario in uh, the 1880s and was doing some prospecting on Canyon Creek, south of Golden. It was here that he gained the nickname Pothole. Uh, Canyon Creek had two immense potholes worn out from the erosion of the creek, turning boulders and gravel in a circular form in the elbows of the creek. It was Kelly's theory that gold would have been deposited into the potholes during flooding and that if he could divert the creek, he would find rich deposits of gold. He spent the winter of 1884 and 1885 whipsawing lumber for a flume large enough to carry the creek over the potholes about 175 feet. His first attempt was washed out by a torrent of spring milk, but undaunted, Kelly tried again, and the second attempt worked, but all he found in the potholes was the leg, bound, leg bone of a mountain goat. <laughs> As Kelly claimed in a masterful understatement, this went to disprove the idea that gold lodged in a pothole, the same as in a miner's riffle. This mining venture did not pan out financially. <laughs> uh, but uh, the miners of gold gave him uh, the nickname Pothole Kelly uh, to make fun of him for his unsuccessful venture and also to distinguish him from the many other Kellys in Golden at that time, all with their own nicknames, among them Kelly the Bum, Whiskey Kelly, and Bulldog Kelly. And our Kelly uh, was uh, of Scottish descent, so his surname was uh, K-E-L-L-I-E. Um, he was, uh, uh, as, as a minor, he was uh, coming up against uh, what they considered to be really unfair mining taxes. Because this area was part of the railway belt, there were both Dominion and Provincial taxes imposed on them, and they were quite incensed by that. Uh, in 1890, there was uh, a, um, um, an election, Provincial election going on, and um, they uh, decided that, that um, Premier Robson was uh, going on a trip through the area, and they decided that lo the local miners decided that they wanted to have a word with him. Uh, there weren't a lot of voters in this area at the time, so he wasn't actually going to be spending any time in Revelstoke, or that wasn't his plan in any case. Uh, but um, 
they decided, the local miners decided that he needed to come here and he needed to address the issue of the mining taxes. Um, so uh, Robson arrived in Revelstoke on a Sunday. Kelly and his committee asked Robson to stay over until Monday. This is what Kelly said in his uh, typescript. Should he decide not to stop over, he was to be taken bodily off the train and compelled to stop over, <laughs> and given the reasons for passing such a ruinous mining legislation. Seeing our committee was determined, he consented to remain over and was taken to Cowan's Victoria Hotel. Uh, so they arranged for a uh, meeting in this uh, uh, Peterson's Hall on uh, Front Street. And uh, he said, Kelly uh, stated, red hot speeches were to be the order of the day and Robson was given the time of his campaign. Speaker after speaker lambasted Robson and his policies and worked the crowd up into a frenzy, although most of the people didn't know that Robson was there <laughs> at that time. Kelly said, on resuming my seat after giving Honorable John Robson some hot stuff in my crude manner, I was applauded by the committee so heartily and was such vim by the whole audience being carried away by the committee applause, compelling them to join in with the committee. The so Premier Robson kept sinking lower in his seat as each speaker made points. Robson must have thought he had no friends in Farwell. So he finally got up and said he had actually hadn't realized uh, how uh, unfair the legislation was and said that he would do what he could to address it. But he also suggested that the local people find a mining man to have him run for office and send him to, to Victoria to bring their concerns forward. So uh, Kelly was, uh, uh, he was talked into to running and uh, he was running against, uh, one of the people he was running against was Farwell and another was William Brown, who was one of the early hotel owners in Revelstoke. And uh, they both attended a campaign meeting at Nelson. And Kelly said, Brown was supposed to be sure of 10 votes in Nelson. Brown charged me with being a government man and CPR man running under the independent cloak and stated he had a letter in his pocket to prove it. I jumped to my feet and demanded of Brown to produce his letter. He had no letter of that character. I told him his heart was as black as the devil was wicked and turned the tables against him and won his vote. And, uh, so uh, Kelly did win by, uh, by one vote and uh, he had uh, 46 votes uh, to Brown's 45. Uh, Farwell received 40 votes and uh, the last candidate, Haskins, received 26. So he became the, uh, the member of parliament for this area. Uh, he re often referred to this area as uh, the, the, the West Kootenai area as the Kootenai cow. And he said that the resources of the, of the Kootenai were being melted off for the good of uh, Victoria and uh, uh, Vancouver. So um, the, uh, see if got. Oh, so, so one day in the legislature, Honorable Joseph Martin, then Minister of Lands and Work, sent a tray over to Kelly with a miniature ba bale of hay and a large placard for the Kootenai cow. <laughs> Kelly used, to this used this to his advantage by holding up the large placard and saying, this is what the government promises Kootenai. He then held up the miniature bale of hay and said, and this is how the promise is kept. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Kelly did win uh, several elections before he was finally defeated and went into retirement. Uh, just a photograph of uh, some miners in the area. I don't know too much about exactly where they were or even who they were, but um, this, there's a, a dog down there and I'm pretty sure that guy's holding a cat. We <laughs> <laughs> um, have a, a um, chapter also on Revelstoke's Chinese community. Um, not going to talk too much about it, um, but of course a lot of the Chinese, a lot of Chinese men had come over to work on the railway. There's estimates that there were up to 15,000 Chinese men who came over on uh, work on railway construction between Yale and Fregality. Uh, they, they, that, that's the only part of the line that they worked on in the original construction because of course there was no way to get them uh, east of that at that time. So they worked on that western section of uh, the railway. And uh, after that there were, there was quite a sizable Chinese population living in Revelstoke. Um, we found these photographs with uh, photographs that came from the, the Dickey family. They're very old 
They were very old negatives. They were actually curled at the edges. But when I looked at them closely, I realized that they were actually photographs of a Chinese funeral. And then I came across a newspaper article about a funeral, and we think it could possibly be the same one. Uh, this is from uh, January 1897. One of the strangest and most interesting ceremonies ever witnessed anywhere was the Chinese Masonic funeral of Mark Singh at Revelstoke on Tuesday. The deceased was a distinguished Mason, had been wealthy once, but died poor. Uh, on Tuesday afternoon, the funeral rites began with a large gathering of Chinamen arrayed in most extravagant and fantastic costumes. Uh, the coffin body was reverently brought out from the tent where it had lain for about a week and placed under a small awning. And then it goes on and, and describes uh, the, uh, the funeral procession. That four men in long black hats and black robes represented, with others carrying guns, a guard of honor, and two of purple, two in purple bearing lanterns, were his aides to light the deceased over the dark river. The great majority, however, those attired in colored vests and carrying many shaped flags and grotesque figures and emblems, represented soldiers, and this semi-military idea pervaded the entire proceedings being carried out in conformity with the Chinese Masonic ritual. And uh, so for quite a few years, probably up until the, the 1930s, there was a sizable Chinese population here. Uh, a lot of them were uh, here without their families. At, uh, like around the, um, the 1901 census of the uh, about 120 Chinese people who were living here, uh, but half of those were listed as being married, but there was only one woman, Chinese woman, living in Revelstoke. So most of their wives were, were still in China. And one of the reasons behind that was the head tax that was imposed on Chinese people. But uh, this photograph was just donated in the last couple of years, and I, I find it quite lovely. I especially like that little lad in the front there. And this was uh, Miss McIntyre, who was the sister of the Methodist uh, minister at the time when she was teaching a class for uh, Chinese English classes. Um, it's the Revelstoke Station town site. So this is uh, describing how the uh, town site, uh, where our downtown is now, how that developed. Uh, this is a really interesting photograph. Sometimes the less there is in the photograph, the more I like it. Um, <laughs> This is um, this would be about approximately where the railway museum is now, or looking towards the station. Uh, that's probably uh, about where the the, the Fourth Street crossing is. There was a sawmill down there. You can see there's a lot of burnt off timber, and not a heck of a lot up there. So it, uh, it was really the 1890s before late 1890s before Mackenzie Avenue, as we know it, really started to to develop. This is Mackenzie Avenue in 1899. And this building here is approximately where Carrie's restaurant is, and there's nothing beyond that. So uh, Mackenzie Avenue was just really starting to be developed in, uh, in the late 1890s. This is the Catholic Church, which is where the Royal Bank is now. And that was later moved to the corner of Fifth and Mackenzie to make way for the C.B. Hume department store, which was the building that was there before that. The Royal Bank. And you can also see there's several uh, private homes in there. And as it became clear that Mackenzie was going to be the main business street, the houses were moved to other locations. Uh, one of the there's one of the, the few houses remaining in the downtown area is the little one uh, behind where uh, just on the same street as Sangabeen, there's a little pink house in there. That was originally at one of the corners on uh, first in Mackenzie and it was moved moved to there. Uh, it's a little bit from that chapter. There was a keen rivalry between the citizens of Lower Town, or the Farwell area, and those of the upper part of town, also known as Revelstoke Station. Whenever a new government service was introduced, there were bitter arguments about where the service should be located. The post office was one of these disputed services. So in 1891, the Revelstoke Station Post Office was established in the Bourne Brothers store on Tack Track Street, in addition to the original Revelstoke Post Office on Front Street. In 1901, the two post offices merged in a new location on Second Street on Government Road, 
And at one time there were also two fire departments in town as well. Uh, Revelstoke Smelter, I won't go into a lot of detail about this, uh, but um, some records cite the Revelstoke Smelter that opened in 1891 as the first successful uh, lead smelter in Canada. Although it wasn't terribly successful, it only was really in operation, full operation for about a month. But it, uh, it sat um, what's in what's now the middle of the river. If you uh, go out uh, to the last street on Campbell Avenue and just walk to the riverbank from there and draw an imaginary line down from Minto Manor, that will be the point in the river where the, the smelter was. Uh, there was a lot of erosion of the riverbanks here, and a lot of that had to do with the, the it was very unstable banks. And because the, the governments couldn't agree on you know, whose responsibility it was, the, the, the erosion continued, and riverbank protection wasn't being provided. So uh, the, um, and because of the Farwell dispute, the uh, smelter company couldn't get clear title to their land, so their idea was to sell lots in this area, because they had a land grant in this area, but because they couldn't issue title, it was hard for them to sell land, and the land was going to finance the, the smelter operation, so it was kind of a perfect storm of, uh, of problems. But uh, the, the smelter did operate for a very short period of time in the summer of 1891. They also had uh, problems getting good supplies of ore again. And uh, finally, in uh, 18, uh, 1898, the remains of the smelter slipped into to the river. Hmm. And as I say, that all of that land is, is no longer there. But um, an interesting thing is a lot of the, um, the men who were involved in the smelter operation, uh, had na the, some of their names were MacArthur, Rokeby, Orton, and Campbell. So that's where a lot of our uh, early street names come from in this area. And uh, our last chapter is on uh, Mount Begbie and a little bit on about uh, uh, Judge Begbie, who the mountain is named after. He was the, the first, first Supreme Court Justice of uh, British Columbia. And uh, I think most people have heard of him. He was often referred to as the hanging judge. Although he always said it was the ju it was the juries that did the hanging. He was the one that that was the only sentence that was allowed to him if somebody was accused of uh, first degree murder. But uh, an interesting character, uh, very educated, very well educated, very tall. He was six foot five, mm -hmm. and uh, said when he went to Oxford, he started a club with the requirement that all members be six foot five or taller. He was the only member. <laughs> Uh, the first recorded climb of Mount Revelstoke was in uh, 1907, and uh, the, one of the climbers was a, uh, a local minister, a Presbyterian minister, and he wrote a very lengthy article in the local paper, so we have this lovely account of their, uh, of their ascent. Uh, so they, they reached the summit on uh, June 11, 1907, which coincidentally was the 13th anniversary of the death of Sir Matthew Bailey Bagby. And uh, in, on the 100th anniversary of the climb, uh, some local fellows, including Rob Buchanan, uh, did, a, uh, did a climb. And um, the Mount Bigby Ascentennial <laughs> Climb, 2007. Good God, I guess that's Mount Bigby over there. Just kidding, we made it. What was to follow? And the Angus they're referring to is Angus Whitman. It was one of the, one of the, the climbers that did the, the, the uh, Centennial climb as well. Um, I'm just going to end with uh, one more Rob uh, Buchanan photo that I couldn't fit into the book, but it's uh, probably going to, uh, hopefully it'll be in one of my books. It's one of my favorite of Rob's cartoons. Mm -hmm. What if Major Rogers took Mr. Rogers to the Scott <laughs> Rogers Pass? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Pass me more dang spitting tobacco. Would you like to be my friend, Miss Major Rogers? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I may have talked long enough for today. <laughs> Do you have any questions or comments? Well, just one comment, Kathy, hearkening back to the asset tenure in 2007. It's worth mentioning that we, as you recall, there was a time capsule 
-hmm. It was a very successful time capsule campaign that had all kinds of things uh, that were gathered by children and contributed by, by local families. We filled this sucker up. We spent a lot of money buying a commercial time capsule. It's about six feet long, and it was just loaded with stuff. It's buried up there up on Mount Begbie. Ideally, I think you have the coordinates, I think. Yes, and they are in City Hall as well. So yeah. uh, hopefully we'll be able to, yeah. 2107, somebody can go and retrieve it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have, yeah, I have a comment as well. It, um, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, anniversary. We had a descendant of uh, the Baring family, mm -hmm. um, Lady Baring. I guess she was. Well, she was, was she was she was Cecilia was Ann Baring. Yeah, she, that's I think uh, she was um, a descendant of yeah, Lord Revelstoke. Yeah, she would be like a, she would have been a cousin, I think, of, of Lord Revelstoke. Yes, yeah. yeah, and so she was very there, eccentric. <laughs> very eccentric, <laughs> um, and uh, so she was there at the at the ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, so. She was quite a, quite a character. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. Did you want to mention oh, yes. Heritage Day? This, uh, this Saturday, uh, is uh, we're doing a Heritage Day at the museum. So it will be open uh, free of charge all day. And um, in, during the morning, uh, from 11 to 2, if anybody wants to uh, research the history of uh, any heritage property, I'll be help, helping people doing that. We've got the tax records going back to 1900, as well as some fire insurance plans. So we can track a lot of the properties, especially if they're in sort of the, 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 the core area of the, the original city. So, and then at 2.30, we'll be, I'll do a heritage slideshow of heritage neighborhoods in Revelstoke. Also wanted to mention that uh, this year, in the, the last weekend in May, we're going to be hosting the BC Historical Federation Conference. So there'll be uh, historians from all over the province coming here. We're expecting, you know, between probably 60 and 100 people. And we're putting together a program, including a presentation on our Land of Thundering Snow project. And there'll be tours to Rogers Pass and the dam and Mount Revelstoke. And then ending on the Saturday night with a banquet at the, the the ski hill at their Mid Mountain Lodge, and uh, we just found out that the Lieutenant Governor of BC is going to be present at the okay. banquet. So that should be a really nice event. Uh, their registration is open to anybody. Their registration is open now on their website, uh, bchistory.ca. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Thank there are books for sale. Mm -hmm. Don't have one yet. Thank you.